And it is my pleasure this morning now to introduce our speaker for today. She is a facilitator extraordinaire. She is a student of this teaching of truth and she continues to unfold and to blossom as she walks this path, always being guided, always being inspired, and always being directed. Friends, please help me welcome to the podium practitioner Sandra Cooper for this morning's enlightenment. I don't Good morning. Good morning, Sandra. It truly is a glorious day. It's hot, but it is glorious. And it's, if you don't know where you are, this is a temple of light, center for spiritual living. You know, there are people who turn up for funerals and it's the wrong dead. So just, you know, this is a temple of light, center for spiritual living in Kingston, Jamaica. Isn't it just great to be alive? Lord, and I sound like and I don't like being alive at all. Isn't it great to be alive, to wake up this morning? So just um, say together, what a special privilege it is to be alive. You see, I don't know what's on the quote-unquote other side. Right now I know I am here. And I'm going to make sure I enjoy every single beautiful and precious moment. You want to come with me? Okay. And so a special welcome to those of you visiting for the first time. It's good to have you, very good to have you, and I hope that you will make the choice to come again. And everyone else did make a choice to be here this morning because sometimes the bed's sweet. Because it gets cooler in the morning, you know, so that's when you really want to turn over, don't? So this past week, as Jennifer uh, might have shared, I learned about the passing of my ex-husband. And I was quite surprised at the plethora and, you know, of thoughts and feelings that came up for me because I thought I'd put that to bed um, some 30 odd years ago. But nonetheless, feelings came. I started to remember things that I thought I'd forgotten. You know, things were just in my, in my consciousness. I remembered when we met, I was... Uh, that's another conversation for another Sunday morning. Um, I have had multiple conversations with my son, helping him to process the passing of his father. And the, the feelings have, have moved from um, indifference, his first reaction was so. Then he called and he said, you know, mommy, I've been thinking that there are some things I wanted to say to daddy and I never got a chance to say it. And so I've been supporting him in processing that. And interestingly, I have also been supporting his widow, who called to, I mean, to, to share, because they, they had been separated, but, um, you know, she now has to deal with getting, the, doing the funeral arrangements and so on. And also his brother, Grub, in, you know, we are now planning the celebration of his life. And in processing all of that, I have had to say to myself and in my prayers, you know, boy, God, I'm, it's like I need a grace, it's the grace of God to help me through that. Because a friend asks me, so, you, you know, you know the ex-wife? I say, yes, we, we were friends. And you know the other wife too? I say, yes, we are friends. So, oh, oh. I said, it's love, you know, and, you know, as Facebook would say, it's complicated. <laughs> but it's, it's all love. So after I spoke about, you know, needing the grace of God, I started to think, what really is it that will help me to see, to, to, you know, to navigate this experience? What is this grace thing? How does one access it? And how does it really work? My search for answers for these questions led me to the essence of my message and encouragement this morning, the amazingness of grace and the healing and transformative role that it plays in our lives. So, a man dies and goes to heaven. I, I don't know if it's my ex or not, but St. Peter greets him at the pearly gates and gives him instructions. So, this is how it works. You need a hundred points to make it in. You tell me all the good things you have done 
and I'll give you a certain number of points for each item, depending on how good it was. When you reach 100 points, you get in. Okay, the man says. I was married to the same woman for 50 years and never cheated on her, even in my heart. So then I knew it wasn't my ex-husband. <laughs> That's wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth three points. Three points, he says. Well, um, okay, okay, okay. Well, I attended church all my life and supported its ministry with my tithe and service. Terrific, says St. Peter. That's one more point. <laughs> what? Just one so so point? All right, okay, how is this? I started a soup kitchen in the inner city and worked in a shelter for homeless people. Fantastic. That's good for two more points. <laughs> two points, the man cries. At this rate, the only way I'm going to get into heaven is by the grace of God, St. Peter says. Exactly. Come on in. <laughs> I'm sure that you have also called on the grace of God when you or your loved ones have been faced with challenging times. Have you? Yes. Mm -hmm. As an eight-year-old child, I vividly recall my mother saying to my grandmother after my father died, Oh, Mama, so how are we going to manage with the five picnic then? She was left alone as a young widow. And the five of us were 11, 8, 5, 2, and 4 months old. My grandmother, in her wisdom, replied, With the grace of God, my dear, with the grace of God. We've heard the word grace in many familiar cliches. You come to grace me with your presence. She, she, look at her with her uppity ears and graces. That politician fell from grace after the scandal in the ministry. I don't call any name. But we know too that creditors give a grace period. And we can say we know all for one so opinionated. His saving grace was his sense of humor. She should have the good grace to apologize. Come, child, say your grace. And when I say many, many times, and you can say it with me, there, but for the grace of God, there go I. Few words in Christian theology are used more or understood less than the word grace. Some people might think about grace as something like a merit system. If you do well in school, you get good grades and win awards. If you do well in sports, you make the team. If you get into college, the merit system continues to reward excellence. In the world of work, exceptional performance earns merit, like promotions and raises. Some religious practices also teach a system of merit salvation. Do good works, and you get to go to heaven. So, the, so what does the word grace really mean and how does it work in our lives as religious scientists? The word grace was derived from the Latin word um, gratia, G-R-A-T-I-A, which means favor or that which has pleasing quality. In the science of mind, grace is described as, and I quote, the givingness of spirit to its creation. It is not about the extravagant demonstrations of care or favor bestowed upon us by a magnanimous entity up in the sky. According to our founder, Ernest Holmes, writing in The Science of Mind, we are saved by grace to the extent that we believe in, accept, and seek to embody the law of good, which is ever a law of liberty and never one of limitation. You see, friends, we are not helpless creatures bobbing about like a cork on the seas of life, at the mercy of the storms of fate and circumstance. Every one of us here 
you know, you and you and you and you. are the very means through which God chooses to express. When you desire spiritual growth, it is God who has first desired it in you. When you make an extra effort in your work, it is the divine urge in you that's working through you. You're not simply a subject of a God who makes notations of good or of sin and error in his big burgundy book. Well, I change it from a black book, you know, but burgundy is a nicer color. You are the activity of God in expression, beloved with an everlasting love. So as we understand it here, grace is not a special movement in mind or a special gift of God. It is God's desire to express through you and as you, which is so great that you can never completely reap the harvest of error. You notice that things always work out. No matter what mistakes we make, no matter how badly we screw up, there always is a way up, out, and um, you know, into a greater experience. Consequently, in spite of the law of cause and effect, you always reap more good than you sow. Have you ever thought about that? You always reap more good than you sow. A medical researcher says that the body is biased on the side of health. Just something simple as a cut. And within an, by the next morning, there's a scab. The body is doing its healing work in spite of how badly we treat it. This is the grace factor at work. According to spiritual luminary Eric Butterworth, and I quote, we are all dynamic expressions of God on the quest to know and release something special in ourselves. We may limit the flow of good, but we can always know the truth and be free. Something of the infinite is always filtering through. End of that quote. Thus the most sordid or limited thought is modified by God's love. Grace, then, is like living in a house with every door and window tightly closed. Invariably, there is just enough air leaking in around the doors and windows so that your oxygen needs are met. You need to know that grace is not dependent upon any special faith or prayer on your part. It is not something you must work for or develop. It simply is. It is an assurance, an explanation of why things are never quite hopeless, why we never receive the full harvest of the error we sow. As one author puts it, you know that the rope is around your neck. God, God's grace cuts the rope, even though you are guilty as charged. Consider, though, that we must be willing to accept responsibility for all that is manifest in our lives. The principles and practice of science of mind will help you to do this, to heal the pain of the past, shed light on the dark places of consciousness, and provide the truth that will surely set you free. You see, there is an upward pull of the universe ever seeking to lift you to the heights of your divine nature. It is as real and, and, and as inexorable as the force of gravity. The master teacher, Jesus the Christ, did the work, and that work enabled us to access a new and higher consciousness of the inner spirit and the laws of life that he taught and practiced. I'm always um, really concerned about how so many of us are into the, the idea of Jesus and, the, and, and, you know, the word of Jesus. But are we living according to that word? Are we taking the message into our lives? Are we applying it in our relationships, in our situations at work, and when, you know, the storms of life? Um, are, are seeming to batter us about? That's a question that we need to ask and answer. 
Let's take a look at how grace enables us to walk the path of spirit. Firstly, grace trains us to be in alignment with spiritual law. The conscious choice of a spiritual path, which is what we have chosen to be on, makes us know intuitively when we are in alignment with divine principle and when we are not. I feel very uncomfortable when I do or say things that are out of alignment with truth. I feel, you know, there's a dissonance. It then becomes easy when we are in alignment with spirit to say no to that which is not in alignment with truth. The person who has tasted God's grace will say no to selfishness, pride, seeking after status and power, greed, lust, and living exclusively for pleasure. Secondly, grace trains us to live sensibly. It is not enough to say no to the lifestyle which generates those feelings of selfishness, pride, etc. One must also say yes to sensible righteous living, living in a self-controlled manner, devoid of impulsive reactionary behavior. That means that we need to be present. We need to be constantly aware of who we are being in every circumstance. Thirdly, grace trains us to live righteously, to live from the inside out, to choose a life of integrity and uprightness in one's dealings with others. Now, this month's Science of Mind magazine has a very beautiful article uh, by Reverend Carol Wilkie that speaks about how Grace supported her recovery into sobriety. She notes that, and I quote, there is a beautiful grace that comes with surrender. We can tap into grace and the awareness of God to the degree that we become conscious of and surrender to it. So there's a letting go and letting God. You know, and that is what grace is about. She continues, when we come to accept life as it is, then we can let go and open ourselves to hope and help because life is always for us. It is never against us. There's a grace of trusting change. You know, they said the only thing that doesn't change is change. That change is, in, is, is inevitable and death is inevitable. So she says, and she invites us to open to the grace of transformation, that which comes from the surrendering and letting go. God is always providing us guidance, so there is nothing to fear about change. Unexpected circumstances provide us with great opportunities to strengthen our spiritual muscles, to enable our becoming. I have been finding that very recently in my work, whenever I'm working on a message like this or whenever I'm having an issue, my words to myself is, Lord God, what I must do? And it's a serious question. What must I do? And then I'll go about my business washing the dishes or I'm on, uh, writing a proposal or doing whatever else I'll do. And then I just hear a little whisper that says, Call Mary, or look in that book, or hold on a little bit. It is as clear as day. When I'm writing, I say, okay, what I must do next? Move that paragraph over there. Or, oh, this is where you can put that song that you wanted to, to have the audience sing. It just comes. And so the question is, is this me thinking? Or is it God speaking? And the way it comes is not through any kind of maneuvering of my thinking. Lord, if I call Mary, then you know, she might not answer the phone. But if I call um, Sue, then you know, but then you say she have the ch No, 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 there's none of that conversation when the, the message of God comes through. It's just a clear, clear direction. Call Mary, full stop. And sometimes we don't listen, do we? You know, are you present to that, that you don't listen? And a little while later you'll say, if I did follow my mind, you know, I would have called Mary. And I, I remember the last time I saw my ex was at a, a social gathering one Saturday morning. And I said, my goodness, he's lost a lot of weight. I must call him, you know. 
and I never did. I never did. And, and he passed subsequent to that. So to be, really follow through on the urgings of spirit, we really need to do that. There's also the grace of intention. We need to never lose sight of the fact that the universe and the very source that we know as God is bursting with unlimited possibility. When we set our intention to rise into being our brightest and best, to fully expand beyond what we can even imagine, to focus on the power of our minds, we move beyond any perceived problem to the solution that is waiting to be revealed, and this is grace in action. You might ask, so how can I be more open to God's grace? <laughs> this is how spirits responded again. So I asked myself this exact same question, and the answer came, by being more gracious yourself in the routine, everyday activities of life. So let's take a look. Some of the gracious behaviors that we can embody, embrace, and practice. Be humble, offering genuine praise to others. To be able to lift people up and say, gee, I like your hair. You know, thank you so much for that gesture. Never seek to cause embarrassment to another. Now, of course, sometimes we are unaware of our actions. Be quick to say thank you, even at the, at the smallest gesture. Even when somebody's doing their job, a waiter brings a meal. That's his job or her job. But say thank you and look them in the eye when we do so. Choose to listen deeply to another more than you talk about yourself. Oftentimes we just wait for the other to stop talking so we can say what we want to say. Listen. Ask questions about what they're saying. Ask for clarity. What do you mean when you say so and so? Tell me a little more about that. Wow, so how does that make you feel? And in that depth of listening, we urge others to open up more and to share. Forgive easily. They don't really take any skin off your back to forgive, you know, to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> My son said, Mommy, Daddy, if Daddy had learned to say, I'm sorry, or I was wrong, it could have made a load of difference. What circumstances do we have where we need to say, I'm sorry, or I was wrong? Think about that. Make a point of paying attention to others. Be consciously mindful to say what is appropriate. Seek out ways to make others feel comfortable and appreciated. Know that you are not indispensable. Sometimes we need to ask for help. And we also need to respect the contribution of others. Recognize the good in every situation, in every circumstance, and in every soul that you encounter. For myself, I have become more aware of opportunities to be gracious, which add a softness to my personality, a lighter delivery in my speaking, and deeper consideration and connection with the people around me. At the same time, I'm quite conscious of the fact that it takes an added dose of patience to be gracious in all circumstances and with all people. Can you relate to that? It is in these times that being gracious really produces dynamic results. Try, try in this week coming to embrace graciousness with someone who has challenged you in the past. Think about it. I assure you that when you demonstrate that graciousness, the communication between the two of you will be markedly more harmonious. To be gracious gives you the and the other person a delicious gift that provides nourishment to the soul and a deeper connection with spirit. So it truly takes a deliberate, conscious choice to be gracious, which will truly shift your energy and raise your consciousness. Choosing to be a gracious person whenever you can leaves everyone you encounter looking forward to seeing you and hearing you whenever it is that you have something to say and to share. If you feel that there may have been an occasion 
when you may not have been the most gracious to someone you know, this is a perfect opportunity to extend a kind gesture and send a note or a card to that individual expressing your sincere gratitude for their role in your life, their help, or maybe just to say, glad to know that you are my friend. Right? Friends, the grace of God has been my absolute salvation. During times when I have slipped and fallen or felt bruised and battered by the winds of change and circumstances. Yet as Paul states in Titus 2.11, and I quote, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Let's say that together. I choose to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. Let's say it together. I choose to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. I'm not so con convinced. Let's say it again. I choose to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. So it's a choice that we make. And I thought, as, as I read that um, scripture, that the words of the song by Balladeer Frank Sinatra, I'm not sure who wrote the song, but you will recognize it, captures the essence of that verse. So I'll read the verse again. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. And the verse says this, yes, there were times, I'm sure you knew, when I bit off more than I could chew. But through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. I faced it all and I stood tall. And did it, and did it my way. Such is the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of God's amazing grace. Namaste. <laughs>